Well, welcome back. This is so exciting. It's a very, very exciting day because here on the show today, we have Jennifer Moss. She's an international public speaker and award-winning author who I happen to know is working on her next book right now. So thank you for taking the time. Um, and she's a workplace happiness expert. She is the award-winning author of Unlocking Happiness at Work, is a member of the United Nations Global Happiness Council, a recipient of the International Female Entrepreneur of the Year Award, um, and she was named a Canadian Innovator of the Year and honored with the Public Service Award from the Office of President Obama. Mm, fancy. <laughs> um, Jennifer co-founded Plasticity Labs, um, which is a company dedicated to improving workplace well-being. Um, so today we're going to focus on that. We're going to talk about the importance of workplace well-being and happiness and fun, um, maybe the misconceptions around what that means and what people um, think success in a business means versus what actually is showing um, growth and success, and then how we can embrace happiness in the current climate in the world now. And I know you're going to have some great ideas about that. So. Um, First, tell me, uh, I, I was listening to some of your talks, Jen, and um, I also heard recently, if, if we can talk about kind of the loneliness thing right now in the workplace, that 18 to 34 year olds are experiencing the highest level and degree of loneliness in the world today, which is shocking because that's normally when you're socializing and you have a great, you know, peer group. Um, and of course, your work is going to affect that. So I know it has something to do with like our devices. And now, even, even like we are today on Zoom, just being on our devices even more. Um, I wanna hear from you what you're doing, what you would suggest to maybe this group of people, 18 to 34, what they could do to improve their level of happiness at work um, especially right now when they're at home so much without their peers. So these are really important topics because before COVID actually struck, you, your stat is correct. There is so much loneliness in that demographic and there's quite a few you know, reasons for that. A lot of shifts in um, just that we don't live in multi-generational families anymore. A lot of young people in that demographic, uh, if they've moved out, they're living alone. Single occupancy dwellings have gone up astronomically, and especially in urban centers. Uh, it's only been in the last 30 years that it went about you know, 5% of people living in single occupancy dwellings to 40 oh. to 45% in, in some of the big cities um, where young people, young urban professionals tend to flock. Yeah. And then, you know, when we look at COVID, what's happened is you have people feeling even more isolated and lonely. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, technology is supposed to bring us together. And in some cases, it has. And fortunately, I think there's the, the only way we could have pivoted in the way that we did from in the workplace standpoint is if we had technology, we couldn't have you know, done this with faxes and, um, you know, and yeah. mail mail. <laughs> so, so you know, my yeah. audience is going, what's a fax? Exactly. That's, that's exactly it. If we had to work with those, we'd be in trouble. So, um, so there's been a huge amount of benefit to being able to use technology, but it has really created a bit of burnout with people who are feeling kind of exhausted by that way of connecting. Um, and also young people really in that, that group, they are looking to their peers to provide them with that psychological safety and that connectivity and that, um, that connection. And COVID just exacerbated an already big problem with young people. There was, we shared a stat, there's one stat that I read just last year and it was only, you know, one in, um, there are one in five young people said that they have zero friends. And that just felt like really sad to me that you could have, z feel like you could have zero friends. And so one of the ways that we are 
trying to help people, you know, especially in that demographic to feel more connected is to increase community. So you're seeing in some places like the UK and now in Ontario and at Western, they're doing this. And I mean, obviously it's, it's probably shifted now because of COVID, but what they had is, um, yeah, people that were living alone, which tends to be young people and then the elderly, um, they were creating these shared housing situations where young people would help out around the house and then, um, you know, for reduced rent and then elderly people had companionship, help have some help around the house. But also what they found is that it forged relationships and friendships. So I really encourage young people to get out of their comfort zone. Um, altruism is a really important way to develop um, your happiness and also create community, which is so important. So yeah. go and um, find something that you feel purpose driven by. You yeah. can still do a lot of that right now in the middle of COVID. There's tons of ways that young people can connect with other young people through volunteerism. And also it's about just finding ways to safely um, allow your teen and um, young people to be with each other. And it's tough because there's not a lot of really good rule following that's happening within that demographic right now. There's know, it's, it's hard, it but they need their peers. They yeah. really cannot exist without that con connection with their peers. So if there's even safe ways of doing that where you're around as a parent to manage and monitor, but young people in the workforce that, you know, have autonomy to do that. Yeah. Um, we really need as leaders to give them a safe space to go into work where they are connecting that work from home forever is not going to work for them. No, because I think what happens is like all this that you're talking about is there's a false connectivity. It's, it's false. We think we're connected, especially that generation. Who, yeah. I mean, I'm from a generation I used to play outside and I used to not have a phone until I was in my 20s. So I remember yeah. it. But the next generation, they have this false idea that, oh, I'm connected. And here's all my friends and they're all here. But what I think you're focusing on, you're talking about is actually in the same physical space. I'm very much an energy person. So when I'm in the same room as somebody, I can feed off their energy, their laughter, their happiness. That's when we get to the depth of conversation that's needed to create that kind of community. You don't just, you can't just create community. Same with what you're talking about with the co-habitation. Um, I mean, they've been doing that in Europe for years. Mm -hmm. University students yeah. living with, with the um, elderly people and becoming best friends, really having a friend that's in their seventies or eighties. I have lots of those friends actually. So I yeah. feel so blessed by that, but yeah, I, I'm glad to hear like what you're saying that we're starting to to do that. But I still think that there's a pushback on that. If we really like in Canada, I, I don't know any young person that's living with an older person. It has to be constructed and there has to be some sort of um, push or win-win that we've seen in North America. I mean, we know that according to research, the happiest people, the happiest countries have multi-generational relationships with living within their homes. So yeah. the way that we've created these barriers, these fences, these bigger yards, these disconnections in North America yeah. has really contributed to our loneliness and, yeah. Yeah. and it's a major problem. And, you know, the thing is, is that you know, if you really look back to the days where we were on the savannas and we were fighting, you know, for our food and, and we had to be safe, safety was powerful in numbers. We needed tribes right. and we mirrored other people's, um, you know, behaviors so that we could be part of the group. Our mirror neurons, you know, need to be connected and activated by being in person with each other. Right. And that whole idea of the tribe is, is missing. And yet, Gen we have a genetic need we have a biological need to be in tribes because that makes us feel safe yeah. um, so we're doing everything sort of against our nature right now by being so far apart um, right. and you can't get that through technology in the same way that you can by being in person with each other sure so let's pivot that whole idea because as we're talking i'm thinking um what I'm doing now as CFO chief fun officer is very similar to what we do at plasticity labs in creating um, a, a healthy, positive culture within companies and businesses. And to take that whole idea, like 
maybe you can talk like how beneficial would it be to create that kind of environment within a company because you've got the senior execs and you've got the younger generation and they're not communicating there is a huge gap in communication which is obviously leading to loss of uh, of profit eventually right and also engagement which is also loss of profit i mean that's that's the the bottom line right but maybe if we could create an environment where those people at the different age levels are encouraged to partner up maybe they have groups together just like we do with kindergartens and grade eights mm -hmm. and they have reading groups and reading buddies why mm -hmm. can't we apply that to the corporate world where now there's maybe we gain a respect for each other because we do things differently we learn to listen better and i think that's key to to a lot of these problems and, and creating that community where it's not just about work, but maybe they'll want to end up talking and spending time together, not just in work. Yes, you know, and there's been such a buzzword around the millennial Gen Zs and, and how, you know, they can connect better with those that are in the boomer demographic inside of organization. And so you see, you know, reverse mentorship and both learn from each other. And, you know, that that has been in practice and it's slowly catching on. Um, but um, what, yeah, slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but when we see organizations that do a really good job of fixing that delta it's, it's hugely successful and it's really you know important you see um companies for example um i i feel like it's um louis vuitton but one of the big fashion brands mm -hmm. has actually actually sorry it's gucci and what they've done is they've brought their um a whole swath of young people into senior and executive leadership like product planning um, and really neat, um, you know, sort of access to young people inside of what would be deemed as only sort of like ivory tower or a very separate space and they've connected them and what they found is this major increase in profits and innovation and ideation and it's because we're trusting each other that in this space we're going to collaborate and you do need to you know opt your organization into that you just can't make it so that others can opt in because they're not going to feel safe unless you create the right. environment where they can do that, right. um, which is like infrastructure and policy and um, yeah. leadership strategy. Um, in, and you really need like forward thinking companies to do that kind of um, work. How important do you think it is for a company or so say out there right now, there's somebody watching and listening and they're going, Oh, I'm a CEO of a company, but I don't know how to do that. Um, so how beneficial do you think it is to have somebody from the outside, so a CFO, for example, come in, work with the company to get those outcomes? So I uh, feel like it's really important for sort of organizations to get outside of their you know, own thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you get diversity of thought and a really good insight. A lot of what we've done is go and ask questions uh, and find out what the delta is between leadership's sort of interpretation of how the organization feels and how their employees feel and um, how employees actually interpret how their leadership feels about them. And usually there's quite a wide distance um, in cultures where it's really strong and they have really happy, you know, well-optimized cultures. You yeah. see that narrowed, you see that gap or that delta pretty close. Yeah. But a lot of what we've seen, and I guess why they bring in a CFO, you know, or, or someone that's a consultant is to, to help them figure out what, what's missing, you know, yeah. what is in that middle part um, to get to be in closer connection to what, you know, everyone's goals is, are, which is, you know, have a good culture, have a successful business, be able to return investment to shareholders and, and um, stakeholders. So um, if there's a big gap, you can't get there. And that's where a consultant comes in. I think like you're describing a CFO comes in and, you know, says, well, there's not a lot of CFOs, you're unique, but uh, your CFO would come in and be able to help people sort of communicate and close that, um, that, that question gap yeah. between yeah. leadership and employees. 
So just for entertainment value, <laughs> I love the entertainment value. Yeah. Can you tell us one example, because you are doing and have been doing with Plasticity Labs. Yes, I am, um, you know, unique as a, a fun officer, but chief happiness officer, officers have existed within companies or have been consultants that have incorporated that into their businesses. Not for a long time. It's a fairly new idea. And some, some tech companies, they think they've got it down because they, you know, check all the boxes, but really they're still missing something. Um, so tell me maybe a, a success story, one that stands out for you, where you saw a company hire a consultant and come in and they just went from here to here and they saw outcomes they didn't even think they would achieve. Is there a little story you can tell us? Yeah, I have so many. And one of the things that I've really learned now, um, and so Plasticity is sort of, it. we closed the doors on Plasticity, but it, the group has moved inside of the Y and mm -hmm. like the YMCA and they are sort of um, become a nonprofit, which is really cool. So, so much of what we wanted to do previously we wanted to give away for free and a lot of, you know, investors don't really want a company that gives all their products away for free. Right. So now with the, with the work going into the why that I'm now separate of, but Jim, my husband and their team is there now, yeah. they're able to kind of continue to work with organizations, but that money fuels then the why's programming, which feels so good. And then hero gen, which is a school initiative gets to be given away. All these great things come of it. But one of the things that we've been able to see is watch these organizations go through all of our work previously to now in the middle of COVID. And the research that we've been able to find with, with following those groups and seeing them now and surveying them right now in the middle of this pandemic has been that those organizations that had high psychological fitness you know, high hope, high resiliency, um, really strong community, really strong trust, trust being paramount. Yeah. Um, those organizations are flourishing inside of an extreme stress event where a lot of organizations are not. And right. we were able to compare those companies that have high trust, high psychological fitness, their high in hope and resiliency and optimism and gratitude that we've been working on developing for a really long time. Yeah. Now they're faced with this stress and you see um, you know, stats like you know, not, uh, upwards of 95% of those employees still feel connected to the mission. They still feel like they are, um, that they still trust that their leadership is going to protect them. They right. feel psychologically safe, yeah. like almost double that of cultures and um, organizations that didn't put in the work. Nice. So when you start to see that happening, you realize, you know, we were trying to get people on board by saying, trust me, awesome. invest, you know, yeah. invest to be optimized be be able to invest because you might see a change event that could be really stressful yeah. never predicting that the pandemic would be the stress event where they'd be stress tested but the fact that you know all of that decade of work investing with these companies yeah. and seeing them now yeah. really handle this experience in a way that's quite um, admirable and inspirational yeah. for me I feel like is the biggest you know you know, I told you so kind of moment, you know, for companies that don't believe in this. Right. And I love what you said. I'm, I might steal it, Jen. The op, uh, uh, um, invest in your optimization now. Don't wait until there's another problem or until the problem's so big that, you know, you are going to scale your business and now you can't because attrition and fear and all of this is stopping you because you don't have the mindset and you haven't got the training needed as a, a, almost like um, preventative medicine for your company, right? That's how I see it. Prevent it so that when something happens, you have a company like what you just described. Yes, and we need to imagine, as we're seeing more and more stress in the world, unfortunately, that you know, COVID caught a lot of <laughs> the world off guard. Yeah. And um, what we have to say is that we can't bury our head in the sand and think that there's no other stresses that are going to, you know, happen. And so we talk about, you know, we know that there's rain, but you can go out with an umbrella. You have tools that protect you from that. And we need to develop a toolkit. We need to develop the the um, strategies and the practices beforehand so that we aren't completely 
completely caught off guard by these types of, you know, tsunamis, essentially, that people are, are contending with right now. So it is, it is like looking at it like um, if we run a marathon, we don't just go and run, you know, a marathon tomorrow. There's a lot of training. And so if you think about your organization as practicing, you know, individual and collective psychological fitness training, yes. you do intentional work every day so that those habits and those actions become traits. You know, you stop being in a, a state of practicing, you actually become what you want to be, and then you can weather those storms when they, when they happen. Yeah. So what would you say to the CEO who is going, oh my goodness, I can't afford anything right now, but I would love to invest in this kind of thing because I love the idea, but oh, that's scary right now. What would you say to them um, during this time, you know, to that kind of mindset? Well, you know, I've always said, just start with education and creating thought starters um, to get people thinking about it. Maybe it's not that you're gonna impose a you know, massive strategic shift, but what about getting some really smart people in a room, an expert to come and talk to them and give them some ed education about you know, what these, you know, these tools could look like? What are the types of you know, things that other organizations are contending with? You know, where is your current state? Getting some questions and answers with someone that knows what they're talking about. And, um, and that just really is education. And then broadening that to the larger employee group, you know, I do a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the way that my work uh, is kickstarted is I go in as, as a keynote or as a, you know, person just speaking to a group to say, here's where we're at. You are not alone. It's okay to feel, you know, what you need to feel right now. Like every experience that you're feeling is valid and here's the science and the data to back that up and then get people thinking and, and kind of ruminating and discussing and then you know later on down the line if it becomes something that they want to invest in more seriously yeah. then you can have those conversations it's not all or nothing it's it's just yeah. getting people to think about the topic and and sort of normalizing it within your organization yeah starting to have the conversation opening up to new ideas to somebody coming in with that cre the, the creative solutions that maybe you're you're unable to think outside that box because I find that sometimes we get so focused on one thing or how things were going to go that you know we just get our knees kicked in when something happens and we just don't know how to move forward without that person that can come in and, and, and kind of hold space for you and say like what you just said it's okay it's okay that we're feeling this way as a company mm -hmm. um, but where do we want to be in a year and then maybe we do need some help getting there, right? Yeah, and for, especially for, you know, large organizations, they're used to just bringing kind of consultants in and out and um, it's just part of their budget line. But for, for younger companies or sort of mid-sized companies, um, especially ones that have been impacted by the pandemic or any sort of extreme stress event, um, they aren't necessarily looking to, to maybe rock the boat too much. But when you're in a time of change, there's no better time to, to leverage the change. You know, never waste a crisis. And uh, we're, in a, we're in a time where there's opportunity to actually say, who do we want to be? Um, I think individuals in general are having reset moments. They're, they're looking at what their priorities are. Um, and so this is maybe the, the most opportune time to be bringing in these kind of conversations because everyone's sort of open to, to the new shift and change um, more than they'll ever be once they get settled back into into their new normal yeah and actually new normal so in I also heard you speak about habits and if we can just touch on that a little bit because we do get kind of stuck in our habits and I completely agree with you even in my own company like I embraced the shift I embraced the challenge mm -hmm. and just like bolted forward but that very much had to do with a mindset that I have been creating over years of mm -hmm. habits, the way I think, the way I do life, um, which is hopefully what I'm, I'm transferring to these companies and businesses. But you talk about habits, you talk about gratitude. Um, maybe you can just speak a little bit um, to that within the workplace, um, creating the habits and how that could help us cope, not just with this pandemic, but like you said, with anything that's going to come your way Plan B, it's always what you do with plan B that, that tells where your company is and, and who you are as a person, right? 
Absolutely. And habits and in, intentional sort of actions every day is a big part of what we've been, you know, promoting in my, form, my former work, current work. It's this idea that if you really do believe in the concept of neuroplasticity, that our brains are malleable, that we can, you know, make tiny incremental changes to, you know, change um, those actions into positive habits, which then actually move into states of being and then it becomes your trait, right? So you move from actually practicing gratitude to being grateful, practicing mm -hmm. empathy to being an empath. And then if you can do that collectively as an organization, then obviously it's really powerful, right? It becomes sort of a network effect and other people start behaving that way because that's the expectation, that's the, that's the example. And so, you know, when we think about habit building, people tend to think that it takes 28 days to form a habit. And when you really look at, you know, some solid science, um, you know, and I, I do write about that piece in the book, this idea that if you really look at changing your habits and your in like an actions and forming these true changes of your state to traits, it can take up to a year to two years. It takes a really long time. There was this one research that was done on just getting people to drink a glass of water um, subconsciously without thinking about it. Such a, a habit to the trade of just making, drinking a glass of water every day. Yes, right? And that's like 12. <laughs> it, and and that's, that's probably just days upon days and then years of focusing on that being part of what you do. But for many people, they couldn't do it. And then uh, in the, the cohort, it was about 100 to 140 days that it took for people to actually develop the drinking water habit. So right. imagine you're telling people to, to change their entire, yeah. you know, mindset to, to being an empath and to becoming grateful in the moment to having cognitive hope skills so strong that you just are always hopeful always there yeah it is a lifetime you know journey and i think organizations this idea of doing a one-year program on happiness i mean or, or focus on well-being as a strategy you know as a programming strategy for two years it's not how you have to look at it organizations need to look at this as being you know the neuroplasticity of the organization and then over time they Con they continue to build up that capacity. It yeah. goes like it's baked into the hiring, it's baked into the mission, it's baked into the policy yeah. and practice. And so all of those things have to just be who you are. It's a, it's a lifestyle change, not a diet. And so once you can start to think of it like that, um, and you can intentionally build up those traits that make you happy, healthy, high performing, um, then it becomes who, who you are as an organization. You just live by those rules. Yeah. This is perfect because it's a perfect analogy with the food. Because if you think about the most successful people when they, you know, want to change the composition of their body, um, the keys are consistency and, but also accountability. And that's why I believe in like what you're doing, what you're doing, what a CFO does, because it takes so much time and you need the accountability over that time to not just create the change, but to keep the change and become that company not yeah. just on the surface like i don't want to attack tech companies but some tech companies just like the check marks oh we're doing it you know or oh we have engagement and then we're successful that's great everyone's engaged but they're missing they're still missing the mark so i think that accountability piece over time is so important and also like shifting a little bit here this is and i want to ask you why you started doing what you do but for me what I was starting to see um, is this habit of the, I don't think, think just millennials, but people not liking their job, their yeah. nine to five. And it became um, habit or the fad to quit corporate job or I'm quitting my job because I'm not happy. Right. right. And me seeing that I am an entrepreneur. Um, it's built in, but also seeing people that try and being entrepreneurs, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So then I went, Okay, so what's the big problem in society? Well, the problem is, let's go back to the core. It's that the companies aren't providing an environment or are some, for many, many reasons, unable to create an environment that people actually want to go to work. Can we fix that? So that, you know, a huge, a uh, huge population, a uh, huge percentage of the population can actually enjoy their, just their, their job, their nine to five. So that was kind of my 
passion around creating this position of CFO and helping people, like helping more people find happiness in their day to day and not living just for their weekends or not living just for the summer. It's like, no, I like going into work. Yeah. And I can, sometimes it's like, you know, this is where sometimes I come in, work with the CF, the C, uh, CEO and go, did you know that half your staff can't find parking in the morning? Can we remedy this, you know, and like restructuring sometimes simple things, sometimes obviously more in depth and psychological and mm -hmm. the neuroplasticity comes in for sure. I love that stuff, but yeah, like just being unaware. So, um, I don't know exactly where I was going with that, but <laughs> no, well, I love what you're oh, saying. I wanted to ask yes, yes. Why? Please comment on, on what I said, but then I would love to hear why did you start? Because it's like, we're kind of on the same wavelength here and wanting to see that same positive change on a big scale in the world. Well, I think, and why I was wanted to comment on what you said, because it's so critical that we do analyze the, the simple things, um, you know, we call them hygiene, but the, they're the little pebbles that just break um, people down over yeah. time. It's the little things in, that are the big things. I mean, your parking example is perfect because it is, um, a real problem when people feel that these little things are being addressed because they seem like they could be easy to tackle. Okay. And if those things are being managed, well, what about the big, you know, strategic things that you're ignoring? And it, and it grates on people every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, and I have, I have actually a funny multiple parking uh, examples of I things know. that have driven employees crazy crazy and really upset them and there's a bunch of ways that they basically have stood out to them as, as saying you don't matter um, and your time doesn't matter and you driving around looking for a place to park it doesn't matter and so it folds into a whole bunch of other things so I think organizations have to get into the small data and the small details but they also have to understand the big stuff and you know part of why we got into this is uh, because I believe really strongly in post-traumatic growth and um, and athletes in particular why they are set up to be successful is often that they're identified as a high performer really early on mm -hmm. and they get coaching their whole entire life and then they're also tested they get put in situations where they are set up for success and set up for failure to learn and so if we don't provide that kind of environment for young people and then up into you know the the workplace um what happens is that they don't actually get these tests and you know we have now snowplow parents that just pave the way for their you know for their young people and they're not letting them fall out of trees and scrape their you know their arms and learn how to ride a bike and fall off of it everything is so controlled and what happens is these young people in the workplace they they haven't really developed the kind of grit that you need to be able to you know do be really successful at work you know I have a great job I love my job but I have tedious boring work sometimes I have stressful parts of my job you know reading 20 different technical highly technical you know research pieces that talk about you know the the science of burnout from some researchers that don't really like to speak in our language um it's it can be really exhausting and boring right. writing a book is very hard and yet um you have to be able to job craft and see that you're you know that you have more control over your happiness in your yes. work um and the goals Obviously organizations, I have this myth fact thing that I say, so it's a myth that um, employees, or sorry, a myth that um, a company is responsible for your happiness. No, they are not. But the fact is they are responsible providing you the conditions that don't detract from your happiness and to help you to be optimized in your, your experience of work. So, you know, they have to create the conditions for your happiness, yeah. um, but they're not responsible for your happiness. So if you get those two things in sync and you are responsible for your your happiness yeah. and you also have an organization that supports that too um, yeah. then it's really powerful those are the organizations that just you know are um, the highest Rising. organizations in the world yeah well and that's why actually a lot of what I do too is I have a 
I've studied psychology. So when I go in there, being able to talk to the employees about what's really going on and not just the employees, talk to the CEO, you know, why are all these employees got a beef with your CEO? Well, sometimes it's about talking to that CEO and what's really going on. You know, how were you hired? How were you brought on as CEO? And how is that affecting you? Because now it's affecting the entire dynamics negatively. Let's get to the root of that and, and try and change something there. Yeah. So it's a huge part of, yes. of the dynamics within. It's just like, think of, of a family, right? You, you have got to talk as a family if you're going yes. to be close, if you're going to have that community. You can have one toxic person, mm -hmm. one who doesn't, but, but I, I look at it like school. Sometimes the bully is the one that actually needs to be listened to. Right. right? Yes. The bully is struggling. There's something going on that, that is creating this, this problem. And so again, I just, I really highly believe in that outside person coming in as outside eyes looking in, who's not biased, who can help with all that inner work that needs to happen in a company. And I, I really firmly believe that this is accessible to all companies. It doesn't have to be just the new startup tech companies or, you know, certain, certain companies that are, have a fun product. It can really be for any type of business um, because there's workers everywhere and we all deserve to have a place where happiness is cultivated. But yes, we are ultimately the ones that are responsible for that happiness, but I think we can be guided and given those strategies on how can I be the one to create my happiness today when maybe all the parking spots are taken up, Yes, <laughs> even though the company did the best they can, you know? So I think that's major skill training too. So, I mean, my, what I want to do and what I'm doing with people is taking them out of first world. I go to a third world country, take them out of a place where they've got devices and access to the internet all the time and get let's talk let's talk about life let's do some real leadership training um so that we can create also sustainability within those companies uh, happiness fun sustainability yes. after the year you know that you work together um it's so important because it's just i think you'd agree obviously you have to keep working at it like you were talking about those habits 29 days mm, you know, how many people have really been successful at changing like a big thing yeah. in 29 days? It's, it's, you're, you're, you're right. It's changing your life and who you are at the core, whether you're a business or an individual. So, yeah, it's really interesting when you talk about getting people outside of their um, environment and their comfort zone um, and taking them to environments where there's not the same level of privilege. And I think, you know, in a lot of, um, you know, tech companies, too, in particular, and the reason I say this is because, you know, in, in our region, in Waterloo, there's a lot of that. And I spent a decade in Silicon Valley, and that same sort of privilege lives there. And, yeah. um, and so there's a lot of perks, and there's a lot of really good, great strategies. But what I found is burnout is extremely high in these groups. And a big part of that is, you know, you can have a ping pong table but if it's dusty you know and no one's using it it's not really the perk it's not really a perk you know you have systemic burnout from really you know um, you know bad policy and um, and organizational you know lack of ac accountability in organizations and so I think you know if we really want to look at building well-being we have to make sure there's good hygiene first we're doing all the you know table stakes right and then people will feel more comfortable you know playing the on the proverbial pool table yeah. you know so culture is not you know culture is not just perks um culture is trust it's community it's well-being um as a focus it's human-centered leadership um and really getting to the root of what's causing stress and then actioning you know the strategies to fix it yeah people need to feel purpose and you can't put up a ping pong table or have drinks on friday afternoon to create purpose and community it doesn't yes. work that's not how it works. No, yeah. and the checklist that people, or, you know, company leaders think is going to work, but they, they miss the, the whole psychological portion of that that makes a person want to play with somebody 
yeah. the proverbial ping pong or the actual yeah. ping pong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? like, and and you have a friend that you, you care friend. enough to spend time with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that you're allowed and afforded the time that your workload isn't so intense that you don't have the time or that people's going to look down on you because you take time to rest, which we need sleep. Right. I mean, all of these things that can be sort of, I think, um, you know, exemplified in that, that metaphor, or the, you know, yeah. the, the example of the ping pong table. But I do think we, we need to start thinking about, you know, changing our, our strategies and our policies really right upstream and at the root um, and getting to know what really matters to the people that are working for us. Yeah. And it's funny, like, I've learned so much from traveling the globe and living in other countries. Just, I think this would be really a strange thing for us in North America, but I remember when I was living in China and I was teaching, it was so common and, and very accepted and not just accepted, respected that at noon, after you'd eaten lunch, the lights went off. You know, yeah. And you <laughs> sleep under your desk. I yeah. just curled up under my desk in my winter coat and the lights do not go on. And it's about a 30 minute break mm -hmm. and we would actually sleep. So then it was funny because I started supply teaching here at Waterloo and I came back. Some days I'd lock my door on recess break, lock the door, close the curtains. And Get asleep. Right, you're right. Because here it was yeah. looked down upon. If somebody had walked in and found me sleeping as a teacher, that wouldn't have been acceptable. Yes, so, even sitting down is unacceptable for so many teachers. And right. I mean, the idea, like, you know, education is a whole space where there's burnout is like top, next to nurses and doctors. It's a uh -huh. really high um, caregiver role and they are highly burnt out because they're passion driven and caregiver driven and will do a lot um, of extra and are often working too much. And you see, I mean, I had one of my um, close friends works for Amazon, but she was at eBay at the time and she went to go visit their offices in China. And she said it was, you know, just that was mandatory. And she had to understand that there's a protected time there. And, uh, and she was trying to bring some of this thinking back to Silicon Valley and it was not well received. I think we need to, think about what other cultures can teach us about you know, rest. And I mean, and we, we tend to look at, you know, people as themes or tropes or, you know, a bi with bias. And we don't think we can learn from other cultures. Um, and we really need to be removing that bias and say, how do we, you know, find certain things that are really great about what they do in those workplaces and, and take them and adopt them um, and, and be able to, yeah. Yes. That's the thing. It's going to take time and it's going to take people who have an open mind, CEOs and leaders of companies who can see that and also know they don't know exactly what to do. Okay. So who, who can help me to adopt these things? Mm -hmm. It'll take the pioneers to recognize yes. this is important. And then the outcomes to see that people are, I know people are more productive when you do have a half an hour nap and that you're not going to get another five hours of work as nearly as, as yes. productive as if they did. So, but it does, it does take time. As, as it, we know. it should, I think, I feel like North America should be catching on by now though. I mean, positive psychology and Martin Seligman and, you know, his theories are basically, you know, 50 or 60 years old now. I think maybe it's time with lots of data to prove that this is scientifically backed and it's evidence-based and there's a lot of data and years of research. So I think employers that don't get it are really going to be obsolete if yeah. they don't catch on. Yeah, and that's, that's what I hope. I hope it becomes obsolete. And that's the mission and goal, I think, of both you and I, Jen, is to move this whole, um, move the whole world forward. You know, yeah. people become happier. They're having more fun. It's okay to have fun. Yes. And, and yeah. be super productive in your job at the same time. So, yes, I agree. Um, I like to end every show with a couple minutes of uh, fast round questions. So just Great. clear as quick okay. as you can. Yeah. And um, I'll give you two minutes on the clock. Oh, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Um, what's one thing you'd love to do but haven't done yet? Oh, that's eat um, pasta in Italy. Oh, I've done it. It's so good. Oh, I'm so good. <laughs> and go to, go to Cinque Terre. That's Cinque it. I need to do it. So that's good. It. <laughs> um, what's one thing you love about yourself? 
Um, my uh, ability to remember statistics oh. and able to translate highly technical information into digestible, you know, readable material. I, you know what, if I could suck up that <laughs> ability from you, I would love that because <laughs> I don't remember the highly technical stuff. I'm like, I read once. Anyway, okay, next question. Um, if you could relive one day of your life, which day would it be and why? Oh, I think the day that I decided I was in love with my husband, I'd been ignoring him for six weeks and turning him down. And then something happened and I realized, yep, he was going to be the one. And I marched down to where he was and I kissed him on the spot. And then we've been together ever since. And it was magic. Magic. Oh, that's awesome. Um, what's the most valuable life lesson you learned from your parents? Um, to be uh, generous with my love um, and not to be afraid of loving too much and thinking that actually changing the language around loving too much that you can really you can be in love with the world and it's okay. And, um, and you need to have someone that's in your life and only bring people in your life that appreciate and respect that um, of you and not think it's, it's too much. Yeah. Oh, we are total kindred spirits. <laughs> awesome. Um, okay. Last question. Um, what do you want to be remembered by? That I, I did have some sort of, you know, impact on changing people's minds and hearts around the value of being a good employer that is a good leader that cares about people and that, and that it's valuable and it's worth investing in and considering. So even if I'm just one person in that large group of people working towards that, I would love to be remembered for that. And I really, really, maybe this is number one, I want to be remembered as a, as a good mother, mm. um, good parent. Mm, that's great. That's so great. And I can tell you for sure that I know you've already made a huge impact on the world and that that's only going to continue. So, oh, thank you. Um, I just want to thank Jen for being on the show. This is Jennifer Moss. She's an international public speaker and award-winning author uh, and workplace happiness expert. Um, Jen, can you just tell the audience very quickly where they could find you? I know you're working on your next book about burnout. I know that you have your book called Unlocking Happiness at Work available on Amazon um, website. Yes, um, it's jennifer-moss.com. So that should be pretty easy. Just remember the dash. And uh, at LinkedIn and Twitter, I'm Jen Lee Moss there. So you can find me. Awesome. And she's busy working on her book. So no speaking engagements till next year. And we can't wait till it comes out. And just again, thank you so much for your expertise and for talking with us today. Um, it was really a pleasure having you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Bye.